Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Chief Content Officer for AdTech, Brad Behrens. Hello, hello, hello. All right. Good morning. Okay, no, no, you can do that after the party tonight. Let's try that again. Good morning. All right, here we go. Welcome back. We're here at AdTech San Francisco. Let's pop the slides up, please. It's our 16th year here in San Francisco. We're thrilled, thrilled to be back. Uh, those aren't the slides. Let's see. There we go. All right. So I wanted to start with one colorful slide. Our friends at Intel released this just last week. What happens in an internet minute? It shows the incredible velocity of change that we have in this, in our industry, in our society. I've said this before, the internet is the biggest thing to happen to the species in generations. It's much bigger than television will ever be. Look at what happens in one minute. Amazon will be joining us on stage in just a few minutes. Sells $83,000 worth of merchandise in one minute. How many people are checking in to Facebook or viewing things on Facebook? Six million. How many emails are sent? 204 million. Nothing is changing the world as fast as the internet. You have made the right choice in terms of where you are today, in terms of your career. It's staggering, it's dizzying. We're help here to help you understand what's going on. That's why you come to AdTech San Francisco and that's why we're here. There's a conversation happening on Twitter. Please join it. Our hashtag is pound AdTech or has AdTech. You will be astonished at how many people are contributing to the conversation that is this event. We have a free mobile app. Please search our website and download it on multiple platforms. We have a staggering seven concurrent tracks of content in the conference today. This is kind of an eye chart, so let's zoom in a little bit. We have tracks on mobile, on brand, on video, display, ROI, and then two tracks of sponsored workshops. It's extraordinarily exciting, it's deep, and your heads are going to be exploding with information by the end of the day. And I want to have a special thank you to our marketing masters for today. We have several more tomorrow. These are industry thought leaders who have helped, worked with us tightly to curate two hour tracks plus presentations in the exhibit hall. We have our marketing master mini tracks in mobile, in video, affiliate, uh, media strategy, and email. And these people have dedicated an extraordinary amount of their time to this, and we thank them for that. Now, this one's really hard to read. This is our advisory board. It takes a village. It's like an Amish barn raising to get this event together, and we lean on these people every single day. And of course, we couldn't possibly do this without our sponsors. Can we give a big round of applause to our sponsors? Because they make this happen, guys. Thank you so much. Now, the exhibit hall is going to open at 10 AM. We have two floors. You've got to visit both of them. They're, the joint is going to be jumping. And it's going to be all sorts of fun. And I want to talk particularly about Innovation Alley, which we launched here about two years ago in San Francisco. It is with, we have a bunch of startups that are really, some of them just out of the garage. Some of them you know, got a little, more, uh, a little more time under their belts. But they're all new, and they're exciting. We want you to visit and to link the innovation of Innovation Alley on the exhibit hall to the conference, we also have our startup spotlight. We've chosen 16 different companies that will present. We, our sessions in the conference are on mobile and video today. And a special thank you to our uh, advisory board members and judges for the competition that will be happening in the spotlight over the next couple of days. By the way, uh, we do this all over the world, and I was very pleased to see uh, a delegation of our friends from AdTech Tokyo here this morning. They're right up in front. Could you guys stand up and wave, please? So there we go. Let's give them a round of applause. They made the longest plane flight to get here. So, all right. Now, this afternoon at 1.15, we're really lucky to have Terry Kawaja doing a keynote presentation. You've all seen the slide. Right, we call it the slide, and it's now morphed into the slides. These are the Lumascapes, which are the prodigious mapping of exactly how complicated things can be in this industry. And he's doing more than anyone else to render uh, order from the chaos. Right after that, this afternoon, we have Robert Scoble and Guy Kawasaki having a, a fireside chat. They're interviewing each other about social media and advertising. It should be very exciting. 
Right after that, Guy will have a, uh, a book signing. And earlier in the day, Evan Balin, the author of Outsmarting Google, is going to have a book signing at the bookstore. And speaking of reports and things written, our friends at Nielsen, as they have done for the last several years, to our immense uh, pleasure and gratitude, have, have released another report exclusively to AdTech, The Digital Revolution, a look through the marketer's lens. You can find it. Uh, conference people can find it in the conference hall. You can download a copy at ad-tech.com slash sf slash report. Please do so. We have a couple of exciting networking events uh, tonight. So this afternoon and tonight, we have our networking pub crawl. Uh, all attendees are welcome from 4.30 to 6. Get your mug and go travel the two different floors of the expo. It's going to be great fun. And then tonight, starting at 6, we have the totally awesome 80s party featuring Tainted Love. Does anybody know Tainted Love? All right, some people who are ahead of the game, the rest of you are going to be incredibly enthusiastic five seconds after they take the stage. By the way, there is a group of people here who made an equally long plane flight from our, our friends from New Delhi, who I just see right here from AdTech New Delhi, which just ended. Could you guys all stand up and wave, please? This is our team from New Delhi. Thank you for coming. <laughs> nothing has bound the far corners of the world closer together than the internet, and nothing we think is doing it with the industry more than ad tech. Speaking of parties, by the way, there actually is a whole bunch of parties happening. You can find out where they are with this hashtag and the, the little bird on the right, what's what, hap what you find if you type drunk Twitter bird into Google Images. In just a few minutes, we're going to be, we're very lucky. We have Lisa Uchneider, who is, uh, leads global advertising sales from Amazon, who's going to join us on the stage. But first, I'm very pleased we have a special guest who's going to come up here in a moment. Uh, earlier, over the course of these sort of high-speed opening remarks, I've talked about uh, technology, I've talked about innovation, I've talked about the industry. If there's one man who embodies the commitment to those three things in San Francisco, it's the man we're about to bring to the stage. We're very lucky to have the mayor of San Francisco, the Honorable Edwin Lee. Let's give a big ad tech welcome. Mr. Mayor, please join us. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to San Francisco, the home of Matt Cain. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Ad Tech, 16 years, wonderful place to be. Uh, this two-day event, as I just was listening to Brad, you've got an awful lot on your agenda today, but it's exciting to be here. It's exciting to be the mayor of San Francisco when we're on the verge of working so well with our technology companies. And it's very appropriate for ad tech to be here in San Francisco, evolving digital media and blending that with marketing and advertising. So I think you've picked the right place to be here, and I hope to be here for another 16 years uh, for this uh, ad tech uh, conference to be here. And for me joining, whether I'm, whether I'm mayor or not, I think it's exciting to be part of this effort uh, to blend in digital media. You know, uh, I've been uh, the mayor for a very short time, but I've learned very quickly how important and how valuable the technology world is to how we do business in our city. Not just because I announced it during my campaign and put out a 17-point plan, an economic growth plan for our city that involved and put right there the technology and innovation uh, world for our city to see. You're creating jobs out there. You're making people connected up every single day, in fact, probably every hour, more than any other industry that I've seen. So it has to be part of the way we run our city. I can't think of a better way for innovation and technology to be rewarded by challenging each other as to how we can improve our city. So before I end this morning on this stage, we're gonna launch this new platform, this innovative connectivity this online ability called Improve SF with you. Before I do that, little history. This year we're celebrating the 100 year, the centennial of our San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, Muni, as many of you might learn who live here. 100 years. And in those 100 years, started out with streetcars and cable cars, and now it's one of the most complex uh, transit agencies in the whole country. We're building another subway. We're connecting up with our Bay Area Rapid Transit. Hopefully in the near future, 
our muni will be connected up with high-speed rail so that some of you might not have to take the airlines between LA and here. You just get on a high-speed rail and in a couple of hours you'll be there in your destination. That'll help us in our economy in the very near future. But while we're doing that, the next hundred years of Muni needs to engage our public as to how to improve. And so Muni, as one of our 60 departments, has asked us to use Launch SF or Launch uh, Improve SF as a website to help with their challenge. How can they improve better? How can they get more on time? How can they be a better agency in our city? And they're one of the most talked about uh, topics. As I go around every Tuesday to a new technology company, I'm asked by the employees, can I help with improving Muni? Can we get on time? Can we make it uh, more accessible? Uh, can we uh, utilize the new routes and new intelligence and the data that we can produce? Well, we're putting that on uh, the Improve SF uh, platform this morning as we launch it. And before I do that, I want to thank uh, this collaboration of local businesses that have helped us uh, design this, uh, design the process for it uh, as we introduce it. Uh, we've got Virgin Airlines, they're going to be part of the prize giving efforts here because we know that in technology and when you challenge people to help us to improve government, uh, you've got to have a reward. You've got to have a Matt Cain type of reward. Maybe not as much, but as least as promising. And then I've got uh, uh, another uh, company, uh, SF Big, the Bay Area Innovation Group, that's helped us. Uh, you'll see at the launch of today's video a little filmmaker, uh, a small a local filmmaker, uh, Pierre Conti, has helped us remind us about where we've come from as a city. And then we've got uh, another local uh, a company, uh, a local person, Alexander Tafla, who helped us design the logo. And then another local company, Bold Italics, who's going to help us uh, take a look at the whole thing and the whole process and invite uh, hopefully winners and identify them for us. This platform is going to allow for the first time an online engagement of the public to help us with challenges in our city. So I'm not about just working with, with our technology companies to help you grow. I want to involve our innovative minds as to how we can improve delivery of service. Because if you can locate in San Francisco, if you're going to get all the talent in your companies, we may as well use the talent for the broadest purpose possible, and that's helping our city become a better city, a city that knows how to do everything better by using technology and by encouraging the brightest minds in innovation to help us. And I'll be there. I'll be watching all of the uh, ideas that you come forth because there'll be two parts. We'll ask you as part of the audience to help us with a challenge. And then we're going to ask you to give us even more ideas that you might have as to how to improve our system. And so Muni's on the front line uh, today. We launch it today. And I'm going to be watching. And then we're going to invite the audience of the whole Bay Area to also submit uh, their support for the best ideas possible as to how we improve our city. So with that, and with thank you and congratulations for your 16th year in San Francisco, let's roll the video.
that exciting? Let's give the mayor another round of applause. Thank you so much. So we now have a very exciting uh, keynote address uh, coming to you. Um, I uh, have been Amazon's uh, customer of the month, I think every month, since their founding in 1995, to, the, to the, the dismay of my family from time to time. They deliver these little beige boxes of happiness all the time. Uh, and then first they reinvent the bookstore, and then they reinvent the book itself. And now, you know, they, with cloud services, they've, turned the, they've started powering the backbone of the internet. It's an astonishing, innovative company. And now they're turning their minds to our industry and to advertising. And when a company as prodigious as Amazon decides to put its mind to something, it's really time for the rest of us to pay attention. Uh, so we're very lucky we have Lisa Uchneider here. She is the global head of advertising sales for Amazon. She joined Amazon in 2008. Uh, prior to Amazon, she spent 10 years at Microsoft, so she's been in Seattle, uh, up in the Northwest, for a great long time. She's going to be here to outline their vision for the future of advertising, Amazon.com style. Let's give a big ad tech welcome to Lisa Uchneider. Come on out! Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Come on. Good morning, everyone. It's day one at Ad Tech. How are you feeling today? All right, it's day one at Amazon, and it's day one for advertising. And I thought I'd open up with a story, and this is a story about Jeff Bezos. How many of you are familiar with Jeff Bezos? Come on, Lisa. So uh, before Amazon, Jeff worked on Wall Street. He actually worked at D.E. Shaw, and this was in 94. And Jeff was sitting at his desk in New York City and pouring over data. Jeff loves his data. And he was looking at the data, and all of a sudden, a number popped out for him. And it was 2,300%. And 2,300%, that was the growth year over year of the internet. And he said, whoa, that's serious growth. Then he took a look at the top 20 catalog companies offline, and he quickly picked books. And he put two to two together, and within 48 hours, he quit his job, he packed up his car, drove across country, and the rest is history. Wrote his business plan and launched Amazon. And from day one at Amazon, he focused on that Amazon is the most customer-centric company where literally anyone can discover and find the products that they're looking for. He's remained focused on this vision over the last 16 years. A few years later, after he moved to Seattle, he actually penned a letter to our shareholders. This is an example of the letter in 1997, where he literally talked about, this is day one for the internet. He said it all the way back in 97. And he talked about how personalization will fuel the growth and fuel the process of discovery for our customers. How many of you in the room remember Amazon in 1997? We have a lot of young people in the audience. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, so in 97, we had a lot of skeptics in the industry. They called us all kinds of names. A few of my favorites. Amazon.toast. I hope no one in this audience called Amazon these names. But Amazon.toast, Amazon.bomb, my favorite, Amazon.org, because we literally had no profit back then. But Jeff, it's kind of funny now, huh? But it wasn't funny back then. But Jeff and, uh, and the leadership team, they were so focused on delivering for our customers, they were completely comfortable in being easily misunderstood and they sort of shut out that chatter. Fast forward to today, Amazon is a very different company. 16 years later, we're so beyond just retail. We're expanded in 42 categories in retail. We're global as a company, but who could have imagined that we get in businesses like Prime, which is free shipping for our Prime customers, or Kindle, who would have thought we'd get into the hardware business and start building hardware? And the list goes on and on, digital content, third-party sellers. 
But again, we've remained focused on our customers, delivering for our customers, even if we are disruptive at times. So we're often asked, start with the customer, and we work backwards. At Amazon, we are religious about our customers. The customers are our DNA of our company. And when we think about our customers, we think about three things. The first thing is we listen on behalf of our customers. And we really listen to them. And sometimes this can be kind of hard because you can be so wrapped up in the user experience, what is the product that you want to develop, that it's hard to step back and say, but is this really truly what the customer needs? The second thing that we do is we innovate on behalf of our customers. This is in the lifeblood of our company. We literally look and listen to what our customers are saying, and we don't expect them to know what to invent. We try to look and anticipate their needs before they even know that they need them. And then the th third thing that we do is we personalize on behalf of our customers. Think about it. When we launched the company in the mid-90s, our personalization and recommendation engine, that is the backbone of our company. For 16 years, we've been building one-to-one -one personalized relationships for the, our customers, helping them in the process of discovering and finding new products. And we're often asked, similar to how we're asked at a conference like this, what will be different in 10 years? I took a look at the ad tech conference agenda. What will be different in mobile? What will be different in social? We actually like to take this question and we turn it on its head. And instead of asking what will be different, we ask what will be the same? And what will be the same 10 years from now for our customers? And by listening to them, we've identified a few things that really won't change. First and foremost, we know that our customers, they'll always want low prices. You wouldn't want to pay $10 more for a product if you could get it for 10 less. We also know convenience. Our customers would want faster shipping. They wouldn't want to wait for four more days. And the third is selection, that vast array of products across different categories. So again, by listening to our customers, we're able to deliver the value that they're looking for and they ask us for each and every day. And by listening to our customers and focused on, our, on their needs, we literally can be disruptive in the process. A few examples of how we have been disruptive in the process, one is Prime. How many Prime members out there? Thank you, okay. So Prime is our uh, two-day free shipping for $79 a year. And when we launched this in 2007, it was incredibly disruptive. And it was disruptive because it was really expensive for the company. We literally, out of our pockets, we said, okay, because it's the right thing to do for our customers, we're gonna show value to them and get products shipped to them faster. People thought we were crazy. But again, we listened to our customers, we focused on the long term. The second thing we've done is digital content. So Amazon Instant Video. Today we offer over 120,000 movie and TV titles to all Amazon customers. A lot of that content is free for Prime users today. And the third area where we've been really disruptive, I think, is in the Kindle. And with the Kindle, again, who would have thought we'd get into the hardware business? Completely different business model for us. But instead of listening to me talk about the Kindle, I'd like to welcome Neil Lindsay up on the stage, who's a VP of Marketing at the Kindle. Hi, Neil. Thanks, Lisa. Welcome. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Firstly, how many of you own a Kindle? Great, thank you very much, it's good to see. Well, in November 2007, Amazon launched the first Kindle after three years of development. <clears throat> Back then, digital books had been around a little while, but frankly, no one was reading them. Even though music and movies had already gone digital, first with compact discs and laser discs, remember those, and iPods, the demand for e-books was frankly minuscule. 
However, books were an obvious candidate to go digital in the same way that movies and music were, for all the same reasons. Low cost production, easy storage and archival and retrieval and search, and of course, much faster delivery. So as a seller of books, among other things, Amazon looked at this opportunity using the three steps that Lisa just referred to. We listened to customers, we invented on their behalf, and then we delivered a truly personalized experience. And since then, we've repeated that process a number of times to bring in smaller, lighter, lower cost Kindles, and uh, along with the affordable Kindle Fire and a whole host of other reading and digital content innovations. Lisa's asked me to take 10 minutes today to elaborate on how we employed that process with the launch of the first Kindle and why that's relevant to us as marketing professionals, especially as we think about Amazon as a partner in advertising. So what is it about reading a book that makes it a great experience? Well, this is the question Jeff and team asked as they considered the ebook opportunity. And to answer it, they did step one. They listened to customers. And in looking at reviews of books people had read and in talking to customers, they quickly discovered that satisfaction or dissatisfaction rarely had much to do with the book. It was about the story. It's about the author's words, the plot, the character. In the hands of a reader engrossed in a good story, the book, that is the technology delivering the content, literally disappeared. So working backwards, it became clear that for an ebook to work, it, it would only be worth reading if the technology used to deliver it disappeared too. With this in mind, we began step two, inventing on the behalf of customers. Because they shouldn't have to, right? We thought about the experience required to determine what would be necessary, and we looked out to the horizon to determine what might be possible, and we joined the dots. At that point in time, Amazon was not a hardware company. We had an internet storefront, a scaled web infrastructure and e-commerce capabilities and, and fulfillment and distribution capabilities, but we didn't build devices. But the working backwards effort told us that customers required an almost invisible and seamless experience between the content and technology and all other aspects of the book buying and reading experience. So we hired a hardware team. We sourced materials. We worked out how to deliver books in 60 seconds over the air. We created software, and we obviously acquired digital content. Many of those things we hadn't done before, and all of them required invention. Then, step three, we personalized the experience. When someone turned on the Kindle for the first time, it greeted them by name. And when they, when they went to buy a book, it had already made recommendations based on what they purchased before and rated highly. Fundamentally, it's this same process of listen, invent, and personalize that we've used over and over again for many innovations, including the development of smaller and lighter Kindles, Kindle Singles, which is content at its natural length, maybe too long for a magazine, but too short for a book, the Kindle Owners Lending Library, where Prime members can get thousands of books, including bestsellers, for free, and the integrated content experience across media behind the Kindle Fire. Even our special offers screensavers on the Kindle has come from this process, driven by customers' desire for lower prices and our determination to make those offers a great experience and beautiful and relevant. And we've made sure those offers disappear, along with the device, when you start reading your book. So, why is listen, invent, and personalization as a process relevant to us as marketing professionals? Well, let me answer by referencing a 2007 interview that Jeff did with Charlie Rose at the launch of the Kindle. Jeff said, and I paraphrase, that the evolution of the internet and digital will deliver a meritocracy where consumers are more empowered with better information and transparency, and that companies need to embrace this reality. Let's hear him. You recognize and embrace it by listening to it or what? Listening to, figuring out what your customers want. Let's say in the old world, you might have put 30% of your energy, dollars, and time into building a great product or service. And then you would put 70% of your energy, dollars, and time into shouting about that service. Mm -hmm. 
In the new world, I think that inverts. You better put the bulk of your energy and dollars and time into building a great service because I think in the new world with information transparency, great services shine through. I got asked today, when I was doing some interviews about Kindle, your product, they said your product launch is very unusual because you're on the cover of Newsweek, that's great. You know, you're doing a lot of uh, media interviews, that's great. But you have no TV advertising. It's unheard of. Yeah. But and, more and more, but our, more and more product launches, I mean, even automobile companies are into that idea. And I, and I think it it's, a, it's a reflection of this trend. And I, I believe that, you know, if you build a great product or service, the, the Internet is a word of mouth accelerator. Right. And if you build a great product or service, people will talk about it. And uh, they will tell their friends. You will yeah. get more word of mouth. And, and we've been doing that for many years at Amazon, and it's been su a successful yeah. strategy. Yeah, for the us. smartest marketeers are, are onto that idea. They really do understand that. Yeah, you, yeah, and it starts with having something that's worthy of being talked about. But somebody. you do much television advertising at all? No, you, we don't Amazon, do any. any. You never have. We do, yeah, we, we, you know, we're, we're actually, from time to time, we test because we yeah. we're very quantitative on things like that. We want to know yeah. would it move the needle? Does it work? Or are we better off putting the money into things like free super saver shipping and Amazon Prime and those yeah. kinds of things? And every time we've done the test, we'll keep testing. You know, we, we want to be rational business people, but our, our starting point is that it makes sense, first and foremost, to just build a great product. So there's three reasons I share that clip. Five years later, still confident in its relevance. The first is that in a world of more perfect information, we can't fool customers with bad experiences, which is why the listen, invent, and personalize process is so important. That philosophy holds true for every product we develop, whether it's a Kindle or whether it, frankly, advertising products for marketing professionals. And Lisa will tell you more about that shortly. The second is, as Jeff also said in this clip, the internet is a great word of mouth accelerator. And as we all know, when people are browsing, seeking information, and shopping, they're really looking for the conversation to help them make that decision. And I personally think of display advertising especially is adding to or helping customers find that conversation. And lastly, as Jeff said, at Amazon, we're very rational business people, especially when it comes to advertising. And we're constantly testing and measuring everything. So as you can imagine, that last point especially makes my job interesting when it comes to TV advertising. But while it's my challenge, frankly, it's your blessing. We advertise, whether online or off, to get the great experience we offer in as many hands as possible, and in that way, drive demand and build brand. Well, since that video was taken five years ago, we have also determined that TV advertising is an important part of the mix, which is why you see us on TV now more and more. And we'll continue to advertise offline and on so long as it contributes to the customer experience by being informative and it delivers measurable results. At Amazon, whether we're developing a product like Kindle or our advertising products, listen and invent and impersonalization of the experience are central to our approach. I'll now hand it back to Lisa, but before I do, I uh, want to prove we do TV advertising now and slip in a Kindle Fire ad. Thank you. The instruction we find in books is like fire. We fetch it from our neighbors, kindle it at home, communicate it to others, and it becomes property of all. From Kindle, fire is born. A Kindle for movies, music, web, games, and reading. Kindle Fire. Give it up for Neil. It was good to finally see a Kindle Fire TV ad, right? Uh, so when I joined Amazon three years ago, I was asked on almost every client meeting, when can we start running advertising on the Kindle? And the fact of the matter was that the Kindle, it was in the nascent days, early days, we just weren't ready. But also in our advertising program, it was early days, even three years ago. We launched our advertising program only six years ago. And we launched with five static ads. I know it's hard to believe. Most of them were below the fold, 
Our reporting and targeting capabilities were pretty limited, and everything was site-served only six years ago. It probably sounds kind of crazy at a conference like this, but the reality was at Amazon, there was a lot of internal debate about advertising, and we actually viewed advertising as disruptive, disruptive to our business, and there was a lot of discussion around, is advertising disruptive to the customer experience? And how can we ensure that we enhance the customer's online shopping experience when we build our advertising program? We have an incredibly high bar at Amazon in everything that we do across all of our businesses. The same goes for our advertising program, whether it's an ad product we build, a creative that we run, relevance that we deliver to our customers, our bar is really high. I think we've made great progress over the last six years, but again, it's day one for advertising on Amazon. So to show the evolution, I thought it'd be nice to share a recent campaign that we ran uh, for the Lorax. And how many of you are familiar with the Lorax? Everyone saw that. Uh, so at the Lorax, it was, uh, this launch happened on March 2nd. It was Dr. Seuss's birthday, and it was also Read Across America Day. And we partnered with Universal. They actually came to us and said, look, we want to try and figure out uh, something that could be immersive and engaging across your homepage for the Amazon customer. And given the nice synergies and the fact that it's Dr. Seuss, who doesn't love Dr. Seuss? It's a book adaptation. We could create a Lorax store. We actually agree with Universal that this would add value to our customers on Amazon. And Universal, they had two goals, reach and impact. And we literally measured everything involved in that campaign, similar to what Neil was describing before. We measured everything so that we could understood how our customers engaged with the campaign, and then more importantly, what we could learn from this campaign and this experience, and hopefully apply it to future advertising launches. So that's the Lorax campaign, and now let's talk about the results of the campaign. Again, we measure everything. We exceeded all of the benchmarks that we set out for ourselves in terms of page view delivery, sweepstakes, video streams, social activation, hit it out of the park, which we love to see. But even more importantly, there were two key data points. The first, we saw a 25% increase in unaided brand awareness, and this stat I love. We saw a 50% increase in the likelihood of parents wanting to take their children to the film. Universal, they were delighted with these results, as were we. And also, I want to give a little shout out to our design team, who I thought did a fantastic job in putting together this execution for the Lorax. So when you look at the evolution of our advertising program and where we are today, we run ads across our owned and operated sites, Amazon, IMDb, Zappos, diapers, soap, the list goes on and on. We also run advertising off on the internet through our audience extension program. We run them across devices, think mobile, Kindle, and as the ecosystem evolves and we're able to connect and deliver value through advertising and enhance the customer shopping experience, we'll continue to evolve our advertising program. And when we think about advertising and where we'd like to take it, again, there are three key areas that we're focused on. The first is personalization. It's probably this running theme that you're seeing, going back to that 97 shareholder letter. Think about it. The personalization and recommendation engine, it is the backbone of our company. I hope, I think everyone in the room raised their hand that you do visit Amazon Thank you for your business, but you know that when you come to Amazon, it is a personalized experience. You're greeted by name. Product recommendations are delivered to you to help improve that discovery process. Again, we have been building one-on-one -on -one personalized relationships with our customers 
for 16 years. We will continue to do that in our advertising program. Our customers, and we have 164 million active accounts globally, they trust and they expect that Amazon, we will deliver relevant content to them and that will promote both convenience and help them with their discovery process. And again, in typical Amazon fashion, we measure and we test everything that we do. The same goes for our advertising program. The second key area in evolving our ad program is innovation. Again, we invent on behalf of the customer. We anticipate our customer's needs. We aspire to do the same thing in our advertising program. We listen to our customers, and it's OK to be easily misunderstood. When you think about how we've evolved as a company since 95, who could imagine that literally there could be someone sitting in this audience today who can pull up their mobile phone, look at an Amazon app, see an ad for a video game, and within three clicks, you purchase that video game sitting in your seat. Who could have imagined that today, the Kindle, best-selling e-reader device, that we can run ads that are beautiful, that help lift and raise brand awareness, and raise awareness about products, and also, you can purchase those products from the device. And then when we think about the opportunities, they're endless. But we always keep an eye on ensuring that we are enhancing the customer's shopping experience. And then the third key area is scale. And when we think about scale, I know that everyone cares about reach. We actually care about high quality reach. 164 million active accounts. It's really important that we keep our customers engaged and loyal and that trust intact with Amazon. Scale is key, and I know it's key for marketers. And there's one category in particular, I'm going to speak to a case study in a minute, where we see big opportunity, that's CPG. CPG, it's day one for CPG at Amazon. And when you think about the millions of moms today who are researching product, discovering product, purchasing them online, and you marry that with the fact that moms basically have $2 trillion annually in spending power, huge opportunity. Last year on Amazon, only 4% of our customers on Amazon purchased a CPG product. CPG marketers, they love that opportunity. So the first case study I'm going to share with you is Kimberly Clark. It's a great CPG partner of ours. And they came to us and said, look, we want to promote Huggies slip-ons. Slip-ons, if any of you are parents in the audience, they're for uh, what they call squirmy babies, right? So it's hard to get that diaper on. So you use a Huggies slip-on. And Huggies, they had uh, two goals. The first was impact, both impact reach, and also they wanted to drive product sales. And we listened to their needs, and we put together an advertising campaign that ran across platform and across device. Before I get into the results, I'm going to speak a little bit about the creative that we built for Huggies. Here are two quick examples. What we're finding, especially in the CPG space, if you look at the ad at the top, offers really matter. Customers like offers. This offer is $2 off plus 20% off of subscribe and save, which is our replenishment program. The second ad shows customer reviews. Many of our customers, they love reading customer reviews and ratings. And what we're starting to do is embed customer reviews right into the ad. I don't know if you can read that mom's customer review about Huggies, but testimony like that is nirvana for a company like Kimberly Clark, thanking Huggies for delivering such a great diaper. So how did this perform? Let's get into the results. So some of the ads that we delivered had offers, and some didn't. 57% of the total impressions included the offer. Of the offer ads, it drove 9 out of 10 considerations. That means 9 out of 10 of the users who saw the ad with the offer, they clicked, 
and they went to our product detail page to learn more about Huggies Slip-On. The second key metric was lift. We saw, for the users who saw the Huggies Slip-On ads, 30x lift increase in consideration, meaning users who saw it, they were 30 times more likely to consider and read more about that product. And we saw a 13x increase in likelihood to purchase. And in mobile, this is a stat I really love. What we're finding is that because so many moms are busy and they're on the go, and sometimes you just don't have time to get online and buy a product, the ads on the mobile, we saw a 2x. It doubled the sales of Huggy Slip-Ons on mobile. Again, those are great re results, and our customers found value in that ad campaign. Let's talk about the second campaign. This one is Ubisoft. I don't know if we have any gamers in the audience for Just Dance 3. Ubisoft, their number one goal was literally to drive incremental sales. And they came to us and said, can we target as many gamers as possible who are also dancers, dancing gamers? And we literally have a segment big enough in our audience segmentation of dancing gamers that just speaks to our targeting capabilities that we said, yeah, we're up for that. We'll put together a campaign. So similar to Huggies, it ran cross-platform, cross-device, mobile and Kindle, uh, both on and off of Amazon. And I'll speak for a minute about the creative before we get into the results. Here's an example of the creative. And this is another uh, feature that has been performing very well. It's add to cart functionality, where literally the user can click on the ad, and in one click, that uh, video game is right in their shopping cart. And on average, the performance that we're seeing with add to cart functionality, we're seeing increase of 10 to 30% in performance. Again, when we're including a call to action in the ad, and we're being very specific with our customers, letting them know about a certain promotion or an easier way to find the product or purchase the product. So let's get into the results. So the results for the Ubisoft campaign, there are a few of them. The ads that included the ratings and reviews was 8% of total impressions. Of that 8%, it drove 22% increase in likelihood to purchase. Lift, again, we saw a 44x lift in consideration. That means users who saw the Ubisoft ad, 44 times more likely, to consider and go take a look and read about the product. 25 times more likely to purchase the product. And brand halo. This is something else that we're starting to really look at and our advertisers are loving it. So what brand halo means is if I'm a customer and I see that Ubisoft ad for Just Dance 3, we're seeing a lift for that brand for their other products and other titles. So for example, here, the customers who saw the Ubisoft brand Halo ad, they're 24 times as likely to consider other Ubisoft titles. That means we see a lot of traffic of users checking out the other Ubisoft titles in our uh, product detail page. Ubisoft loved those results. And again, we aspire to measure everything that we do to ensure that we're delivering a great customer experience and that we're able to improve our advertising moving forward. Okay, so with that, I wanna thank you for your time. I hope you learned a little bit more about our advertising program on Amazon. It's definitely day one for us, and each and every day we aspire to be the most customer-centric company globally we listen to our customers, we invent on their behalf, and we personalize for our cu customers. And we look forward to partnering with all of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Hey.
Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Come thank on up you. for a couple questions. All right. All right. So, hey, man. thank you for being a loyal Amazon shopper. Oh yeah. Well, day uh, one. Oh yeah. No, I've been there for a long time. What's the last thing you purchased on Amazon? Uh, I purchased. It just don't make it embarrassing. No, no. I down. Can I ask that so question? We have uh, Paul Adams and Joe Turo both speaking tomorrow on the main stage, and I downloaded and read both of their books on the Kindle. So. Good answer. Uh, so, thank you. Well, thank you. So let's. Let's, let's get some other answers. Sure. Um, we've got a bunch of marketers and, and their agency partners in the room. So what's their, their takeaway for, you know, what's the most desired outcome of your talk today? If a marketer's walking out of this room, should they be thinking about Amazon at, for, for, for direct marketing, for oh, strict e-commerce, for brand? What, what do you want them to take away thinking, okay, I've got to try using Amazon.com for my marketing and advertising needs for what? Good question. So I would see it as both. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding with many of the advertisers that we've been working with, um, they're realizing we're not just focused at point of purchase in that funnel. Mm -hmm. We're doing a lot of innovative work moving up the funnel at the consideration and awareness. Um, for example, we're working closely with Nielsen on home effects where uh, working with CPG clients to show and consumer electronics the lift offline and the sales that we're seeing offline, not even on the internet. Um, we're also doing loads of brand studies to demonstrate brand awareness. So I would say both for brand and for driving sales. So, okay, next question. Uh, as you might have heard when I was opening, I, I talked about our team from India, our team from Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, we have many guests from all over the world. So ad tech is global. You mentioned Amazon being global. Tell us about what you're doing outside of the US, particularly with regards to advertising. Are you partnering with people? Like what's happening uh, beyond our fair shores? Sure. So uh, I have global responsibility. So we currently, we have teams in the US, UK, Germany, and Japan. This week, we launched in France and Canada, which means I get to make sales calls in Paris. I can't wait That's for good. that. And we have future markets in store. And more importantly, um, both our advertising platform is global, and our ad products, we have 95% parity across market. And I'm seeing more and more global marketers raising their hands saying, hey, we want to figure out how to have a global partnership with you. And it sounds like you're doing things to make it easier for us to be able to execute across markets. So we put out a call for questions uh, on the ad tech blog, and we got a few back. And one of them was from Susan Bratton, who's right there. She's our uh, chair emeritus from ad tech. Um, mm -hmm. Hello, Susan. Can you wave? Thank you. Um, and she asked, it, it was, I'm going to paraphrase the question. She wanted to know about, and because it touches on what you said a moment ago about offline lift, about uh, what Amazon is doing outside of its own environment. And so specifically, um, when it comes to Google search results, because people buy things at Amazon, but they often find things through Google. How are you, and how's the advertising pairing up with, with Google, with the search results, but just more generally with things outside of your own environment? So, good question again. So the way we look at it is, um, we start with the customer and we work backwards. And we work with our advertisers to better understand what their marketing goals are um, and try and help them achieve those goals. And in terms of how we integrate search and display, it entirely depends on what the marketer is looking to accomplish. Okay. And then last question. This one is, I'm going to have to read this one. It's from Peter Haran, who many of you will know, a former media and advertising CEO for IAC and currently the chairman of Halogen Media. And he wrote this on the blog. He wrote, the, the conventional wisdom among people who have good perspective is that Amazon will sell close to $1 billion in ads this year. How close to accurate is that? Does Amazon think of itself as a media company, at least in part? OK. Yeah. So uh, we don't break out our ad revenue, uh, so I can't share right. that. Um, and Sorry about that. And then in terms of whether or not we're a media company, I get asked that quite a bit these days. And again, we just, we're, customer centric and we just listen to what our customers need invent on their behalf and deliver for them and if our customers are telling us that they want more digital content which a lot of customers are telling us today mm -hmm. we'll invest in things like Amazon Instant Video. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Right. Well, well thank, thank you, you so much. Let's pleasure. give Lisa a big round thank of applause. You. Great start to the next couple of days. So.
So with that, the morning session is now complete. The expo is now open, and the breakout sessions in the conference will start in just a few minutes. Please be back here uh, at 1.15 for Terry Kawaja, which will be, will be followed by Gag Kawasaki and Robert Scoble. Thank you for coming to AdTech San Francisco. Often, am I better off?